This is the Ampex VPR 200 composite NTSC digital VCR. Machines powered on and booted up. I used to be able to read the display easily, but the outer layer of plastic has uh, clouded up. Uh, you can see TC, time code, all zeros, and uh, some information. Used to be able to read it, but I think time has caused the plastic on the uh, covering the uh, display to uh, to be uh, not viewable but disassembly of this panel might allow that to be removed and or replaced so today I want to just uh, do a little tour of this machine I've had it for a while but uh, we're moving on so to speak and uh, have to let some things go, so we're looking for a home for this machine. It's currently not working, but in the right hands with someone with the knowledge and skills and spare parts perhaps, might be able to get it working again or use it as a source of parts for another machine. Here's a look inside the top cover at the mechanism of the machine. So here's a look at a tape that's in the machine. This is a Sony D2 cassette. This is the larger cassette. And you'll see that it says uh, D2L126M. This is a two hour tape. And uh, <laughs> it got stuck in there on me uh, a while back when I was working on it and uh, had not figured out how to back it out. Again, I thought I would do more damage than good if I took the mechanism out of sync or something. For an idea of reference, this is a VHS tape, so this gives you an idea of how much larger a cassette that is. They made tapes up to three hours long. I believe they made a 380 in that shell. Here's a look at the uh, mechanism electronics. This is a card with the green LEDs blinking is the master control card. And I'm going to try to go through the uh, electronic assemblies on this machine in the time that I have. This is the video, me the mechanism, and the scanner head. I believe it, it may be a four head, uh, four playback, and four record, because you got one, two play, and three, four play. so much about this equipment is it's just built absolutely with no expense spared on anything <laughs> everything is just it's amazing that they could build something like this and sell it at a price that even a major corporation could afford The cards here are titled. Uh, over here is Transport Servo and Transport MDA. Master Control, AST Servo, which I believe that's the, the head drum motor. Thread Servo is probably a servo motor that drives the, uh, threads the tape and the mechanism here. This is giving an idea, I mean, this is the the track here that the tape would ride along. The arm is, can't really see it, it's back up under there. You can see barely through all that cloudiness Ampex D2 logo like a screensaver floating along there. And if I touch the control, in this case the jog shuttle wheel, brings it back out Okay, I'm going to 
pull the mechanism out. The entire mechanism can pivot upward for servicing so we can get a look inside this marvelous machine. And let me move the camera around to the other side now. On the, uh, the main casting, the number in the bottom right may date the machine 9317, 1993. That may be the year it was made. And you can see just all the gears, just everything is incredibly well built. Okay, here's the best look I can give of the underside of the tape transport. This massive uh, round unit here is the uh, head scanner, video head, drum motor, and uh, that might be the one for the uh, transport. Man, I mean the intricacy of this is just unbelievable. Also, you'll notice this air hose and you'll be wondering why is that here if you're not familiar with these the machine uh, has its own compressed air supply and uh, some of the filters and uh, for that are back here these glass bottles and uh, they provide a supply of clean air for the uh, video head which floats on a cushion of air the air bearings in it Here's a look at the video head. This unit has about 5,000 hours on it, and it may be time for an overhaul on that. That may be the reason why the machine was retired. I don't know, but... Here's a look at your video head tips. The little black uh, recesses there in the side of the drum. So while I was uh, tilting the machine back, I found I could uh, move the tape loading arm and uh, slide the tape out in the front. It got pinched in the mechanism of the tape and of the cartridge, the shell at the moment. But um, again, for comparison, here's a VHS up against a large D2 tape. Here's a look at the... Uh, electronics section down below there's uh, 17 cards actually there's a slot for 18 in this machine and they're behind this door that swings down with a big air filter in it and I'd like to go through the cards just to get a quick look at the contents of the electronics in this So here's card one from the machine. This is Audio I.O. And uh, like all the cards in this machine, the back, it's, it's uh, bolted to a sheet of aluminum. I mean, there's just no detail spared on this to keep stray signals from being picked up from an adjacent card because they're pretty close together in that cage. But here you've got an Analog Solutions ADC. You can see Silicon General was the company that made this true 16-bit audio. So I guess that was a uh, analog to digital converter box you could buy off the shelf, so to speak. Dual sample and hold amp. And just every board just jam-packed with electronics. Lots of uh, multi-turn, those blue multi-turn pots in there. So that's card one. Okay, this is card two, which is probably identical to card one. It's another audio I.O. card. And my suspicion is that this is a stair... Uh, a stereo card, two channels, 
because uh, there's four channels of audio in this tape format. Digital audio, of course. Here's a look at the, uh, the header pins on the end of the card, and of course all gold, I'm sure. No expense spared on this. And another Analog Solutions ZAD 2716-2. All right, this is card three, which is the AES interface. There's a lot of 74 ALS 374 chips. And I'm trying to read some other numbers here. Um, 74 ALS 299s. And if this is uh, AES, as in AES EBU audio, it might be a, an interface card that would uh, give you your digital audio connectors on the back of the machine. Okay, this is Audio Data Record, card number four from the card cage. A lot of logic here, 74. HCT-173Ns. I mean, I could go all day with this. Uh, <laughs> 74HCT-154. Just a mass of, uh, of uh, logic chips here. Um, I can't quite read the, the larger dip there. Might be LA... Yeah, I really can't read that. And all of this is probably the reason why this machine draws like a thousand watts <laughs> in operation. Audio data record right here at the end of the card. On to number five. And this is card five, video data record. And uh, again, just lots of uh, logic ICs. KM 62258 LP-10. Whole bunch of those. There's a custom ship. Made for Ampex here. 1295-125-01. Made in Korea. Wow, this is interesting. The uh, the date on this Ampex, probably an EEPROM. Copyright 1987. I don't know if these were made that far back in time. I'm looking over here, most of these chips our 1992 manufacturing date year I mean uh, 74F 399's here's the uh, oscillator 5.36 megahertz oscillator another possible EEPROM there with a label over it over the uh, erase window just another small city, that's Video Data Record, card five. And this is card six, Video Input. So I'm thinking this took your analog composite NTSC signal and translated it into their proprietary digital sampling. That This machine didn't use MPEG type compression. It used a proprietary lossless compression scheme and it supposedly from what I've read they sampled the entire video signal and then used a lossless compression algorithm on it to lay it down on the tape free of any uh, digital losses. So this format was probably well I know some some vintage uh, programs were archived to it 
Um, but mainly this thing was used as digital format, of course, because you could go many generations and do animation and things like that without uh, degradation to the video. And uh, this TRW chip, I wonder if that's gold. <laughs> that's a TRW. What is it here? It's a 9305AH 1049GHC. I'll try to get information on these ICs and print them up on the screen. I'm just reading them out. There's too many numbers here to, <laughs> to even possibly document them all. Can you imagine the size of the uh, service manual set for this machine? It's probably mini phone book. Mini phone books. <laughs> I don't even know if... Uh, I mean, some of these chips are socketed, but I wonder if the owners of these machines didn't troubleshoot down to the card and then send the bad card into Ampex or what. I mean, I guess there's people out there that could definitely... Uh, I mean, you could get your your scope probes on these uh, logic chips here. Man. Just can't imagine the complexity. How <laughs> How many hours of engineer hours were expended to produce all of these uh, boards and how you could do it at any price to me it just seems so incredibly complex this is card 7 and it's just labeled encode decode and again it's just another C of logic ICs MC 10H 5P Motorola chips And here's the Ampex, probably their part number, 274-502, and that might be a date, 10 slash 92. The M2 encoder decoder assembly. <laughs> and there's uh, some LEDs here, DS1 and DS2. And uh, there's some coaxial ports probably uh, these are and of course a whole bunch of test points here too these are probably for diagnostic purposes imagine you could plug your oscilloscope into those get a look at the signals on this card okay this is card 8 sync inner decoder that's sync inner decoder and it's uh Assembly 1501090-04. These Sony ICs are interesting. They're uh, CXD 1038s. We'll try to find out what those are later. Whew, just more logic. 74LS 283Ns. Of course, plenty of uh, places for spares. Why in the world? Uh, they must have... Uh, they must have found a way to eliminate those ICs, you know, and uh, do it more efficiently. Because you can see there's spare, spare places all over the board here.